Why do we recycle? What are the economic incentives behind recycling behavior? That's the question we're going to address in this video and which the authors address in Chapter 9 of our textbook. They have a really nice, uh, simple model that I think is helpful for considering this problem. And on, in this model, we have along the horizontal axis the percentage of the total waste stream, let's say, coming out of a household that is recycled. So on the left, we have 0% uh, recycling. That would be 100% of the, of the waste going to landfills. And on the right would be 100% recycling. So that would be everything that comes out of the high household ends up in the recycling bin. Um, the percentage of the waste that is uh, recycled then increases from left to right, and of course there's a cost associated with that. So in this um, figure we present the marginal cost of recycling, and so the very first units of, of waste um, coming out of a household might have a negative cost of recycling because, for example, uh, you might be able to take a, uh, your clothing to a resale shop or get a tax refund by taking um, stuff to Goodwill. So the marginal cost of recycling is negative at first, but then increases fairly rapidly because at some level getting um, stuff to the recycling bin or finding somebody who'll actually take it uh, can be quite expensive. As we move from right to left, we are thinking about increasing uh, uh, the disposal rate, that is, throwing more and more stuff into the landfill. And for our simple analysis here, we're going to assume that the every unit of waste is simply a, a fa uh, has a fixed cost, and so the marginal cost of throwing more and more waste stays the same. So if you re if you recycle or you throw in 10% uh, of your waste into the uh, uh, landfill, that's going to be twice as much, uh, cost you twice as much as if you um, dispose of 5% into the landfill, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so from left to right, we have increased recycling. From right to left, we have increased waste fill. And so any point on the, uh, the horizontal axis then will suggest a particular level of recycling behavior. And in this case, we found the cost minimizing uh, allocation of recycling and landfill, where to the left of W1, every unit of, of waste, the cost of recycling it is, is less than the cost of sending it to the landfill. And uh, to the right of that point, it's cheaper to just send the, the waste to the landfill. So the consumer, in this case the household, will tend to send 1% uh, of their waste into the landfill. Now, is that going to be socially optimal? Well, there, there's good reasons why we might see some externalities associated with uh, the waste problem. So, for example, on the disposal side, we have um, a, any time you put um, uh, waste into the uh, landfill, there's going to be uh, there's going to be more landfill space taken up. So, recycling reduces the need for landfill. Uh, recycling lowers the waste externalities, so associated with pollution or disamenities associated with landfills. Um, and then, of course, there's litter. Anytime you recycle something, it's not going to get end up as litter. On the use side, there's uh, when you have uh, recycling material that's going to reduce the energy use and um, uh, the energy required to produce materials from recycling. Recycled stock tends to be lower. Uh, in the case of an aluminum can, it's much, much lower. It's only 5% of the cost of, of recycling or creating a can from raw stock. Uh, there's also lower production externalities as, as a result of that. And then, of course, there's conservation of raw materials if we recycle um, our material stock. So uh, there's good reason to suspect that maybe there's a uh, external cost associated with throwing stuff to the landfill. And in this figure, we've represented this as just a fixed marginal external cost of disposing. Uh, and so the socially optimal level of uh, of disposal would be where the marginal cost of society of disposing is equal to the marginal cost of recycling, and that would be at W2. But unless those external costs are internalized um, through in some way, um, we would end up back at W1, where there's uh, the marginal cost to the individual is equal to the uh, marginal cost of recycling to the individual is equal to the marginal cost of throwing it to the landfill. Ironically, uh, in practice, we typically actually move the other direction. Uh, so in this curve, we say, let's suppose that there's the marginal cost of the city, which is the our old marginal cost curve, and that's that certainly every time the city uh, moves a truck and, and hauls a bit of waste away, that costs the city some money. But to the individual, the marginal cost is very often 
at zero or um, very very close to zero so for example in my household we pay a fixed fee per year to have a bin that we can put out in front of the house but whether we send that bin out full or empty this the cost is exactly the same so our the marginal cost to increase the amount of waste that we put out is for all practical purposes zero so if we were behaving economically rational as this model would suggest we'd be back at w1 um, where the uh, marginal cost is uh, of recycling is zero, and which is the marginal cost of the landfill, whereas the city would like us to be at W23. Sorry about the bad notation in that, but um, the to the right where the marginal cost of the city is equal to the uh, marginal cost of recycling, and then of course with the externalities incorporated, uh, we'd want the so social optimum would be at W2, uh, further uh, to the right, even a higher level of ec of recycling. How do we change the incentives? Well, one way that you can do that is through a bottle bill. And uh, in a bottle bill, a every time you buy a can or a bottle, you have to pay a tax, basically, of five or ten or up to fifteen percent, fifteen cents per um, can or bottle. And then you have to take that can or bottle back to a recycling center, and and you're rebated uh, the tax. Uh, what this does is it means that if you put a can into the trash can, that's costing you five or fifteen cents uh, and so the marginal cost of, of putting stuff into the landfill uh, to you as a consumer actually goes up and you can see that there's a number of states uh, throughout the country that have bottle bills uh, and that has been a successful in, in reducing or, or increasing recycling rates for those um, uh, for bottles and cans although it's not uh, uniformly uh, applauded uh, Recycling rates vary a lot across the country, and you'll see actually these are data from 1999, but uh, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of variation, and uh, Texas actually has a fairly high rate, uh, but some of these states in the Northeast where they have bottle bills have uh, particularly uh, high rates of recycling, uh, over 40%. So uh, what's another reason why households may recycle? Well, one commonly referred to uh, cause is what we call warm glow, or just sort of that, that warm, fuzzy, good feeling that we get from recycling. And this is certainly prevalent uh, in society in many, many households uh, where people say, well, why do you recycle? Well, it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's not that I'm, I'm saving money or it's, uh, or it's easier for me, uh, but rather... Uh, there's some sort of social compulsion to do that or uh, internalized uh, the people have decided that they, they want to uh, recycle. What this the effect of this is basically in an economic framework is to shift the uh, the marginal cost of recycling uh, down so that uh, the equilibrium is moves to the right and people instead of recycling W1 which would be the pure economically rational uh, level, uh, sort of the augmented economically rational level would be W4 uh, to the right, a higher level of recycling. So that's all I have on the economics of recycling. Uh, I hope this is helpful in preparing you for to read chapter 9 and, uh, and helpful in thinking about uh, recycling in general.